So first of all, thank you very, very much for inviting me here to give me the opportunity to uh, present uh, myself and uh, to take you through uh, a round calls from academics to the industry and all the way back into more or less academic, <laughs> back home, so, so to say. Okay. So uh, uh, why did I call it a paradigm shift? Uh, basically, because that is something I've always been doing, is questioning existing paradigms, or the uh, new word is canonical ways of uh, looking things. I like to question them whether they are really good for us or not. Uh, so what are we talking about today? First of all, um, being... Uh, what I am. So I would like to talk about my, myself, starting off. Uh, so uh, I started off as an under, undergraduate. Now, I'm not going to go back to Adam and Eve, but I'm old enough to get very close to that. Uh, so the uh, I started as, uh, as an un undergraduate, actually now 40 years ago. So one of the uh, first lectures uh, I went to was uh, Physical chemistry, laws of thermodynamics. Uh, so I went there rather naively, I have to say. Um, uh, but I enjoyed this very, very much. And that's been a driving force, not because of the laws of thermodynamics, uh, but of the uh, theory behind it. What is driving things in chemistry, in biochemistry, in life? Uh, and that is where uh, the... Uh, laws of thermodynamics came in, and they've been uh, been with me more or less all the way through, all the way through my uh, uh, active life, shall we call it, or, or career. Um, so uh, basically, uh, after going through the the uh, usual things of uh, undergraduate and graduate uh, studies, I then uh, started working at the uh, Max Planck Institute for Experimental Medicine. Uh, in Göttingen, uh, Germany, um, to look at protein nucleic acid uh, interactions. At the time, that was the, the molecule of interest was tRNA. So we were looking at uh, tRNA interaction uh, with the, the synthetases, uh, with the um, uh, elongation factors, uh, and then uh, tRNA uh, moving on to the ribosome, how it interacts. And the uh, and the, uh, the the changes that the tRNA takes in tertiary structure, uh, and I, I can re remember our, our seminars. Uh, I was sitting next to my, my professor's uh, large model of tRNA, about that that size, three dimensional model. Uh, that was most impressive uh, to me. And I'm always sitting next to it, and I was all, always wondering how does this work. How do you get, uh, with tRNA, uh, the, the specificity of the right amino acid onto the right tRNA? How does that work? And then get transported uh, to the ribosome and uh, the accuracy uh, of the whole translational process. I found most intriguing. And by the way, uh, I don't want to tread on anybody's toes, uh, but we were looking at the specificity of assays. And uh, I can tell you PCR, uh, or the, polymer, the polymerase was not at the top, it was further down at the bottom. Uh, so um, the, my, some people might say this is a bit arrogant because PCR did change a lot in, uh, in science. Uh, so that was uh, me as, uh, as a uh, PhD student, and I, uh, I was moving on, or I wanted to move on, uh, to small RNA uh rnas as regulating uh agents um in the in the cellular process the only problem i had was i was 20 years too early the my rna came came later so uh i then decided no ian you want to move forward uh and you want to be where the action is and i decided uh to go into the uh to the industry uh and found surprisingly uh, well, first of all, I have to say, uh, as a PhD student, I thought I was being, uh, I was monitoring the literature fairly widely, uh, reading uh, two, three times a day, spending a couple of hours 
uh, following the literature, and I was proud of myself trying to be as broad as possible. And in going into the industry, uh, and I started off working for a company uh, called Amersham, Amersham International at the time, uh, then sold to uh, General Electric, uh, now, uh, now um, the, it, it split up, the non-radioactive part is now with Sativa, uh, so excellent products, but that is where I saw, wow, the world you've been looking at up to now is about that size, and indeed the world is that size. So there is so much to, to learn, to see. Uh, so moving into the industry uh, is highly challenging. And um, so um, that is where I went through, uh, went through my paces. Uh, uh, and, and I have to say Korea uh, ended off as, um, uh, as a managing director for a company in, uh, in Germany. So they quickly moved from uh, research into a, a total sales operation. And that, that means uh, um, explaining complex products to people who, and new technology, to people who have prior to that never heard of it. So you have, you have to, uh, it's the uh, reduction of information to uh, cut it down to an understandable uh, level and then carry that forward. And also, to go out there and sell, uh, because that that is what pays salaries on sales do. Um, so I, I did that, and um, then I learned one thing, uh, very important: market needs. Uh, there are, there can be technologies out there, whatever. If they do not meet market needs, the technology or the products will not be accepted. Uh, and that you learn the very hard way in, in that if you have a product and nobody buys it, the product dies very quickly. Um, so I, uh, in the course of that, I then uh, um, met a couple of uh, scientists, also from a Max, from two Max Planck Institutes, and uh, we started setting up a company, a biotech company, uh, which is an adventure in, in its own. So raising funds. Uh, I raised uh, 18 million, D mark at the time. Uh, and uh, we set up a technology uh, to develop vaccines, which we did. Uh, we had a vaccine uh, that could uh, protect uh, from a bacterium that uh, infects about, well, more than 50% of the world uh, population. Uh, and not only that, we could treat. There was a big but. Uh, the development where it was done. In, ma in a mouse immune system. Uh, and at the time, that was uh, the beginning of the year uh, 2000, the pharmaceutical industry was not interested in vaccine technology. Again, I was two year, 20 years too early. 20 years later, it would have been a problem. Okay. Uh, so, uh, um, short answer to that is uh, further funding, forget it. So uh, I had to dissolve that, uh, everything. It, uh, the technology we had at the time, I still consider brilliant. Uh, but time's gone. And, uh, and nowadays, the, the new messenger uh, vaccines, I, uh, I think, uh, are great. And so uh, that is a bit of a uh, paradigm uh, change. So that continued, and we have, we're seeing new things. Um, and while developing uh, the, uh, the vaccines, we also had to improve the diagnostic procedures. Uh, and that is uh, to speed the identification with Helicobacter, obviously prokaryote, with it's the uh, uh, detection uh, of uh, and identification of bacteria, uh, which at the time uh, took, well, quite often still does, take two to three days to do it. And with the technology, with the uh, fish technology, um, the uh, the you, you could do that in uh, a couple of hours. Uh, but still, the uh, the fish te uh, technology um, with the third and the third, sorry, first generation uh, was a procedure that uh, required a washing step, uh, which was fine to run 
in, in, in our laboratory, uh, in the laboratory, uh, laboratories in, uh, in Munich, Greater Munich, where fish technology uh, for the identification evolved. Uh, no problem. But transferring that to a uh, city like Amsterdam or uh, Aarhus, oops, sorry, uh, had a problem. I went there, uh, showed them how to do it. Fine, it was working. They did it in parallel with me. A week later, uh, I got a call. Sorry, technology is not working. Uh, and so what I learned there is I was not aware or not taking uh, enough um, attention to details. And the detail uh, in the fish technology uh, is that uh, you need to wash. So I love taking a shower, but I hate washing in silence. Every washing step is, uh, is, uh, gives uh, opportunity for cross-reactivity and can uh, present havoc. And that is what happened. Uh, working my lab, fine, could do it, not a problem. Uh, but transferring it to other, other laboratories, oops, no. And um, this is uh, a picture of um, uh, of, uh, of a um, stomach uh, biopsy where uh, we're looking for Helicobacter. So the probes used here is a uh, Helicobacter probe, uh, which is uh, carries a green label. In this case, it was FAM. And then a probe towards uh, um, clothromycin uh, resistance, which is a point mutation in the 23 sRNA. Uh, and where you have both together in the same cell, see, it's yellow. And so the, the point mutation uh, probe itself is, is red. Where you put uh, red and green together, you get a yellow picture here. Yeah. So this we could, uh, we could uh, set up uh, and run beautifully. Uh, I got that to, to run in Anchorage in, in, a, in a laboratory just by email. Uh, in South Africa by uh, email uh, and uh, and uh, telephone, uh, no problem, uh, running beautifully. But was this a successful product? The answer is no. Why? Because you need to use a fluorescence microscope. And in going out into the market, seeing fluorescent microscopes, how they have been treated, maintained, no wonder it did not work. Um, so uh, it was. It was. It is a shame. It's a beautiful assay. Uh, beautiful, getting beautiful pictures. Um, and this, if you if you have a clothromycin resistance, obviously you do not want to treat uh, this patient with clothromycin. Okay, so it would be uh, rather interesting for the patients uh, who would be saved a lot of mistreatment. Uh, so that was quite simply that was not uh, good enough. Now, um, yeah. so uh, the washing step was it was the culprit. Uh, so I sat down and said, "Well, what can I do uh, to generate a next generation fish uh, product?" Which I did. Open it up. I need to hurry up, I think. Um, so I developed uh, a fish probe and I turned it into a beacon probe. Uh, so, quite simply, uh, uh, the specific sequence, uh, specific for, uh, for, a, uh, for an organism, X, whichever one you want, uh, I added a uh, three prime, five prime sequence so that they would form a stem. Uh, one labeled uh, with a fluorophore, the other with uh, with a quencher, and quite simply, when it was binding, uh, it, started, it, started, it started to get a signal, and it did not need to wash, which was a godsend because all of a sudden, yes, it worked, and I could get it to work in uh, in other laboratories without a problem. Only remained the treatment of uh, fluorescent microscopes. So, and in a routine laboratory. Uh, uh, high volume laboratory, uh, there was little patience for microscopy. And uh, so what, uh, what I found out 
the hard way is, sorry, it was not good enough for a routine assay, high volume in the in the microbiology laboratory. Quite simply, not good enough. Okay. Uh, so I then uh, moved on to saying, well, okay, the, the technology, there's still a lot of things we can do uh, with fish. Um, and so um, after, after a while, I found a way uh, which uh, I had to go. I, I had to work around my own patterns, um, which I managed to do in the, in the, the third generation fish. Um, to get that going, uh, I uh, generated uh, the uh, fish technology, which is uh, applicable not only to the identification um, of, uh, of, of um, uh, prokaryotic organisms, uh, but that also gives a stronger signal, which would allow me to move into the detection of uh, messenger RNA, which is something that was missing in the original fish technology because the fish was identification, but still the major problem in the treatment of, uh, uh, of infections is which antibiotic do I use? Um, so uh, having a nice and easy assay uh, to identify the uh, um, antibiotic susceptibility would be of, of interest. Uh, I forgot to mention one little thing. The fish generation, uh, second generation fish have a, has a turnaround time of 30 minutes. Um, so uh, if you have a uh, positive blood culture, uh, within 30 minutes, I could report which organism is, was, uh, was the culprit. Uh, so that is, was a novelty. And going into hospitals, uh, I went to in intensive care units, talked to uh, the uh, heads of this uh, intensive care units. Yes, they wanted this kind of product. The nurses, they, they, would, they wanted to hug me, say, give it to me. Um, I showed it to the uh, laboratories. Uh, they said, yeah, mm, okay, that's fine. Uh, but did they put it into routine? No. Why? Microscope again. It's in the microscope barrier. So that wasn't, that wasn't good enough. Uh, so I am now in the process of uh, generating um, that into an, uh, uh, into an assay that will work on... Uh, or something a lot simpler called uh, microtiter plates. Uh, well, that's, that's future. We'll see how that is going to go. Um, so here we were looking at individual um, uh, analytes. And so that is in, uh, in itself was interesting find that we, need, we needed to take that a, uh, a bit further. And so we were with the individual analytes uh, we were in, in the region where we were talking about uh, looking at genomes, proteins, where we have some 20K uh, different proteins. Uh, and uh, that, is, uh, that is old uh, canonic, the old canonical view. And taking that into transcriptomes, uh, you're looking at 100K. Um, but that is not yet uh, what really interested me. But getting up here into this region, this is where life starts becoming really interesting. Uh, and this, this is where we are moving uh, right now. Now, uh, that uh, brought me to uh, uh, not only me, everybody involved in, uh, in uh, NEMDX, to look at what do we really uh, need to look at. And at the time, we got a challenge uh, uh, from a uh, pharmaceutical company uh, in, in Boston. Uh, and they said, well, could you, uh, could you set up uh, an assay for TDP-43? Uh, so I said, well, OK. Uh, I have to be very honest saying that uh, Prior to that, I had uh, very little to do with TDP43. Uh, so, but as a protein that is uh, involved in regulation, 
uh, of uh, uh, protein biosynthesis. Uh, it must be involved uh, with uh, RNA and protein. So I said, well, if we have uh, an RNA-protein interaction, it should be possible uh, to generate an assay. So, yeah, uh, that is uh, what I looked at. And uh, I started looking at the, the literature. Uh, I could find, obviously, lots of it. A lot, uh, lot of the uh, structure, a uh, lot of the, the, uh, the structural um, components of TDP43, what it can do uh, in, in the nucleus, in the cytoplasm. Um, but uh, being a good old-fashioned uh, biochemist, I found little description of TDP43 as an enzyme. Now, thinking of TDP43 as an enzyme, I learned was a novelty. Uh, it's a regulatory protein, fine, but is it, uh, is it active? If so, how is that active? Um, so I then uh, uh, had to think of ways of looking at it. Uh, for TDP43, uh, it, uh, it was uh, pretty straightforward. Uh, I looked at the literature, uh, and then we, we could see um, that um, there is a, a, a domain, a motive. Uh, we uh, looked at the, um, at the motive and uh, said, well, okay, if it has a motive, we should be able to devise a synthetic uh, a messenger RNA uh, and let's see what it can do. Will it do something, yes or no? Uh, and set up an assay to say, um, well, yes, we are seeing something. Um, so I did that. And uh, so, no, oh, sorry. Again, here, we're looking, uh, looking at the design of, uh, of the assay, uh, I came back to my basics, and that is uh, the thermodynamics. And that is uh, also one of the major uh, issues I not not issues the the things that I did in setting up the the fish probes. Uh, in the, with the fish probes, I I could have uh, over a hundred different fish probes, uh, which could be multiplex. Uh, and uh, so the way uh, that was achieved is by simply looking at the delta G or the binding of the specific protein. Uh, of the specific sequence, uh, and if you uh, if you keep it at a very stringent range, you can basically uh, run all of them in the same assay uh, and and get them to work. So they become multiplexable. Now that is something that is uh, is required. Uh, so at the time uh, we could set up um, an assay. Uh, and have uh, and uh, being able to identify sixteen different organisms, uh, problem causing organisms uh, within half an hour, uh, and that worked beautifully uh, in a multiplex assay. And the same uh, uh, we could do for uh, for sputa, uh, especially for cystic fibrosis patients. That was um, uh, that was extremely exciting to me. <coughs> Being able to uh, to do that, so uh, again, I, I was back to the basics. Forty years ago, started off looking at thermodynamics and uh, remembering what delta G actually is. Uh, and uh, so, anybody coming into my lab uh, uh, will learn uh, what thermodynamics are and the importance of delta G. Uh, and if you design probes. Uh, the TMs are of lesser difference uh, within the uh, within the stringency uh, of of the probes. Uh, that I only allowed plus minus uh, one kilocalorie per mole. Uh, the TN could go up plus minus ten fifteen degrees. So I, I wasn't I wasn't bothered uh, about that. As long as the delta G was working, I could multiplex. So in all the future. Uh, developments, um, 
uh, I uh, uh, taught everybody in, in our team to think thermodynamics, and that is what we need. Um, so uh, the basically what we have to uh, make sure of is that everybody starts looking at the free energy in the binding of uh, in the in the binding uh, of proteins with nucleic acids. Um, so, so the uh, assay itself, uh, if, if if you develop an assay and you have a very complex assay, taking lots of steps, possibly including washing steps, um, you might be. Uh, you might have a beautiful assay, but again, as I learned the hard way, if it involves a microscope, you're not going to be happy. Uh, if you have something, that is, if you have a nice homogeneous assay that you can run a, a, in a microtiter plate, uh, you're kidding. So that is uh, what we set off uh, doing. Uh, so the TDP43 assay was from the outset uh, designed to be able to run a, in a microtiter plate. And uh, within, uh, uh, I wanted to keep it within less than an hour initially, just to see what is happening there. Is is an hour enough? Is it is it fast enough, giving us enough time for that? And it, it's turning out to be uh, an hour's generous. We can uh, shorten that down. Uh, so that is the uh, that that is for the TDP forty three. Uh, and then uh, we, uh, we we found that uh, there is a, a, a large need for further assays uh, with TDP43. That happened to be uh, an enzyme activity, uh, but we were looking at other uh, proteins, and we need to have something which is uh, more important. Uh, so. We started looking at technologies. Which technologies do do we have um, yeah, on the on the uh, analytical field? And basically, what we're looking at is um, uh, we have uh, antibodies, uh, we have aptamers, uh, and then uh, we have uh, further assays with, um, where we can go more uh, down into uh, mass spectrometry. Uh, which becomes uh, interesting again. Uh, but antibodies, uh, whoever has been working with antibodies knows how long it takes to get antibodies, poly be it polyclonal, monoclonal, uh, and uh, getting specific antibodies. I think everybody who's done that uh, knows uh, it's a lot of work and it takes time. Okay. Now, the same for uh, aptamers. Um, the aptamers, fine. Uh, the way they are made, um, I assume that uh, most people here know how uh, aptamers, aptamers are made. Uh, it's a repetitive process uh, which takes time. Uh, and uh, one of the biggest uh, problems with aptamers is the uh, specificity getting uh, a highly specific uh, aptamer uh, to work. Uh, so again, it's time uh, until you get it, and then uh, at the end of it, lack of specificity. So we've seen many companies failing, few still ongoing, working on it, uh, trying to improve uh, the, the uh, aptamer uh, technology. Um, so that is where we started uh, uh, moving on, uh, and then uh, that is where we started moving into, uh, which I now consider more exciting stuff. Uh, and in that, we said, ah, now then, if there are, uh, if we know protein nucleic acid interactions, and know that uh, neither proteins nor nucleic acids are made of cement, looking at two molecules that move towards each other. And very seldom would you see a uh, good uh, God-fearing uh, messenger RNA or any other RNA 
uh, without the presence of a protein. So they must be interacting with each other somehow. Uh, so initially, you start off with the uh, electrostatic interaction where you find uh, uh, the two moving together. And now if you do an intelligent design of your probes, you can design it in such a way that they bind together uh, uh, very quickly. Again, my postulate that it has to be done uh, in half an hour-ish. Uh, so actually, we're getting it down to 15 minutes. But I like to keep it, I'd not put too much stress on this. So we're, get, we're getting it down to a uh, total turnaround time of the assay of um, under, uh, under an hour. So that is working beautifully. How that works precisely, unfortunately, I'm not allowed uh, to disclose properly because obviously uh, uh, we, we put in a patent for this uh, and that has not yet been published, but that will be happening soon. And uh, so internally, um, uh, Emmanuel, we, uh, uh, we're, we're able to discuss it here, uh, but I uh, unfortunately right now I cannot uh, tell you precisely how, that's, uh, how that works. But we are progressing nicely on this. So uh, what we what we uh, got is, first of all, the TDP43 assay uh, showing us the activity here, uh, 60, uh, um, 76 uh, normal or non-infected patients, and then uh, we have uh, 18 ALS patients. And you can see here a marked difference between the two. So uh, we are we are seeing uh, a difference, uh, a clear difference uh, between normal and ALS infected um, patients, and this is uh, the um, the quantity the quantified using our assay, which by the way uh, we call um, we called uh, RAP. Um, uh, RNA affinity protein and the W is uh, quite simply because it enwraps protein. So that, that's how we've got the, the, the name wrap internally. Uh, if it catches on or not, we'll, we'll see in future. Um, TDP43, uh, anybody who's been, who's been working with TDP43 uh, knows it's, uh, uh, it's just that protein, you know, it uh, does have its tricks up its sleeve. So getting uh, a serial dilution is not easy, uh, which we managed uh, to do uh, with, uh, with Emmanuel's help. Uh, we managed to set it up in such a way that we could uh, get uh, um, uh, what we were looking for and uh, so have a nice post response uh, uh, and getting down to the same region uh, as the antibody assays are, are getting. Uh, antibodies have a lower detection limit around about here. And we can get uh, uh, get uh, this a bit closer. Uh, there is one further thing I need to say. This is based on a uh, European-based assay, <coughs> and uh, handling working with European and time-resolved fluorescence uh, is complex, shall we say, uh, and and challenge challenging. Uh, so these these two are made uh, uh, with the European assay. Uh, and as of last week, we managed to uh, uh, set up a, a FRET-based assay, which is um, a lot better. Uh, uh, but again, too early to show data uh, here, but that is um, uh, something that, that we have running nicely. So what, what com comes next? That is one of the reasons why I am here. We're looking at things. There is obviously with TDP43, a lot of work that still has to be done uh, to fully describe TDP43 as an enzyme, uh, to get it published. That is what we need to do. Uh, and then uh, there is with the other, uh, the other proteins and neurodegenerative diseases, we need to decide uh, which ones we want to look at. Uh, the setting up of uh, uh, of a new uh, RAP assay, uh, first step, um, 
where optimists can take quite uh, some time in the uh, iterative process uh, for me to start it up is, uh, let's say, within one or two hours uh, uh, with a sequence. Uh, and then uh, we will be finding uh, the way to find the best possible sequence because in, in principle, I can run we can run along the whole protein and have uh, uh, our wraps to whichever part of it uh, that we uh, want to look at. Um, so that is where we will be going in future, setting up uh, assays uh, that uh, hopefully we will be able to run in uh, uh, to five assays in parallel, uh, requiring only five microliters of serum or uh, uh, plasma, which makes it highly interesting if, you want, if you're looking at um, uh, samples where you do not have a generous amount uh, available for you. Uh, but that is uh, where we are right now. Uh, so building up these assay, which, by the way, we call, um, uh, we call chinkwa uh, assays, uh, that got its name, and that is uh, a bit of history behind that one. Um, and that uh, our laboratory is in Sandwich, which is at Kent on the uh, south coast. And one of the fears uh, us Brits have is being uh, invaded by the French. Okay, so Henry VIII uh, set up five forts along the coast, and they're, they're called uh, uh, Jinkler ports or. Uh, Brits always like to uh, express things differently, uh, sim simply sink ports. Okay, so uh, that is how the, this, this name came up. Uh, and uh, internally, it's it got the assay, uh, uh, Chinkwa uh, uh, assays. Uh, so th that, that is, in, at the moment, an aim. We're developing each one individually, and they have to work together under the same stringent conditions same delta G uh, for the binding of uh, the individual ones uh, so that they could work together, same temperature, same assay, so you can run them all the way through. So that is uh, where uh, that is where we are working together. Uh, and I'm very much looking forward to uh, uh, carrying on. And there's a lot of work to be done. I'm well aware of it. So. Okay. Sorry. What what comes next? <coughs> A lot of work. Very simple. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs>